Good morning. Thank you for joining the Kent County Health Department's COVID-19 employer and employee webinar. It is 10 o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Just a few participation tips for those of you that are joining us. Closed captioning is available at the bottom of the screen by clicking the subtitle option, as well as if you have any questions throughout the panel discussion, please insert them in the question and answers and we will get to them um, as, as many as we can at the end of this session. And with that, I will turn it over to the Kent County Health Department Director, Dr. Adam London. Dr. London? Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Lori. And especially thank you to all of you, the employers and the employees working here in Kent County. It has been a tough year for everyone, but I really wanna thank you for all that you have done this year to be creative and innovative in making our workplaces as safe as possible. Here in public health, we know that a strong economy is critical to having a strong and healthy community. Just over this past weekend, I was uh, reading an article in the Wall Street Journal, which said that our economy right now is growing at the fastest pace that it has in the past 18 months, and that consumer confidence remains high. And I believe that that is in large part a credit to all of you, the employers and the employees, who are doing your part to keep transmission of COVID-19 in the workplace as low as possible. So please keep up the good work. As Lori mentioned, my name is Dr. Adam London. I'm the director of the Kent County Health Department, and I'm joined today by two of my colleagues, two of the coolest and smartest people I know, uh, Dr. Narali Bora. Dr. Bora is a physician and the medical director here at the Kent County Health Department. And she's gonna talk to you in a little bit about testing and some related issues. And also I'm joined with by Brian Hartle, who is an epidemiologist here at the Kent County Health Department. And he's gonna talk about isolation, quarantine, and issues related to that. Uh, and overall, the goal of this morning's meeting is to provide you with some general public health guidance to help you keep our workplaces as safe as possible, to help our local economy continue to stay open uh, and to serve the people of West Michigan. So right now I'd like to take you to the data dashboard that we have at accesskent.com. Uh, this is a dashboard that you can find by going to the COVID uh, resources page. And there's a, a lot of data uh, on this dashboard. There's actually seven pages of data. I'm not going to go through all of that now. Uh, I just wanna highlight a few of the, uh, the, the, the big items that we're looking at. So on the front page, in the upper left, you'll see the Kent County uh, data. And this is a snapshot of where things stand at this time. You'll see that to date, we've had 13,842 or 48 uh, cases of COVID-19 reported to us. Uh, this is information through yesterday at 3.30. It updates every day at that same time. Yesterday, we had 361 new cases of COVID-19 reported to us. That's actually the highest one day total that we've had so far. And that's concerning because I think over the course of the last week, we've set a new record for new daily cases about three or four times. Uh, so these new cases are continuing to, to grow in number. Our total deaths right now are 179. And you know, our hearts and our prayers go out to all of those families who've been affected so severely by this. Uh, I do find it a little bit encouraging, however, that our case mortality rate, which is the number of deaths by the number of total cases, uh, is only about one and a half percent, where statewide it's about four and a half percent. So again, this is a testimony to the great work that all of you have done in making sure that our hospitals have not been overwhelmed so far. At the bottom of this page, there's another uh, graph I wanna show you. And that's the number of cases by age group. And that's the blue bars in the lower left. And each of those bars represents the number of cases that we have seen uh, for each decade of life. The tallest bar that you see there is the 20 to 29 year old age bracket. Uh, for most of this past summer and into September, we were seeing that younger people, especially in that young 20s uh, age group, 
uh, we're really driving the number of new cases here in Kent County. What's concerning to us is that at this point, we're starting to see that spill over into other age brackets, uh, especially the older uh, age group. So for instance, uh, last month, the month of September, for the entire month, we had 70 people over the age of 70 diagnosed with COVID-19. Through four weeks of October, we're already at 459 cases in that 70 and older group. So that's very concerning for us because those people we know are more vulnerable to the most serious uh, consequences from COVID-19. Let's go to page two on the dashboard. And here on the right, we have two graphs which show uh, uh, cases and deaths by date. In the lower right, we have our new confirmed cases by date. And you'll see back uh, on the left side of that, back in May, we had our first wave of cases. Uh, and then things kind of settled down over the summer. And for most of the uh, late summer, August and September, we were seeing about 30 to 50 new cases per day. And that was a number that we could easily handle with our case investigation. Our hospitals could handle that kind of number. And so we were pretty comfortable through the, the mid-summer and late summer. As you can see from that line on the, the bottom uh, right, uh, our number of cases has increased substantially here in the past four weeks. And we're now uh, averaging, over the course of seven days, we're averaging about 250 new cases per day. So that's very concerning for us and it's beginning to seriously tax our, our healthcare system. On the upper side, uh, on the right, we have our deaths by date. And you'll see that we had our, our wave in deaths, if you will, back in uh, May and June. And then over the summertime, those deaths uh, became much lower. Back in May and June, we were seeing about three to four deaths per day. Over the summer, it was about one death every three to four days. Now things are picking back up again, and we're seeing one death uh, on average every day. So we're very concerned about that. We wanna make sure that as these cases increase, that we don't see an increase in deaths. So that's something we're watching very carefully. And if we can move forward to page three on the data dashboard, this is a page which uh, shows the data from the employee health screenings. For those of you who are participating uh, in our employee health screenings program that we've made available through uh, resources at uh, kentcountybacktowork.com, the data from all those health screenings are included uh, in uh, this graphic where the, the blue bars uh, show how many employees were screened uh, every day in that program. The darker blue line uh, at the bottom of that graph uh, shows the percentage of how many, uh, what percent of those people were excluded from work that day because they showed up to work with a fever or they answered yes to one of those screening questions. Now you'll see that line is, is kind of creeping up a little bit higher, that, that dark blue line is, is creeping up a little bit higher. For most of the year, it was at about 0.2%, now it's at about a 0.4%. So 0.4% still doesn't seem like a very large number. Uh, less than 1% of the people who are coming to work are being excluded because they're failing that screening. But when you look at the overall number there at the far, uh, far bottom right corner, you'll see that uh, that number actually right now equates to 2,633 people in total have failed that employee health screening. Now, certainly not all of those people had COVID-19, but some of them did, perhaps quite a few of them did. And so by excluding those people from the workplace, untold numbers of, of outbreaks were prevented at places of employment. Untold numbers of businesses were able to stay open because they didn't lose their staff to an outbreak. So that's very encouraging. We also believe that many people never even, you know, they called into sick uh, instead of showing up at the screening. Uh, many people, because this screening is in place, woke up with a fever, with a cough, and decided to stay home and not even uh, challenge the, uh, the employee health screening. So we think that the presence of these employee health screenings is very positive in keeping your workplaces as safe as possible. And if we can go back to the slides now. So 
So on October the 6th, I think everyone remembers the Michigan uh, Supreme Court ruled that the orders, the, the emergency orders that the governor had, uh, had signed uh, were unconstitutional. And that was not because they did not rule that, uh, that having an order requiring masks was unconstitutional. In effect, what they did is they said that the executive orders uh, were based on emergency declarations that were based on a law from 1945 that was an unconstitutional law because it gave too much authority from the legislative branch to the executive branch. And so the governor was using the law appropriately. The problem was the law was inappropriate to begin with. Uh, what happened after that, the following Monday, October 9, is the director of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services issued orders under a totally different law, the Public Health Act, uh, Act 368 of 1978, which gives the director of that state department, along with local health department directors, certain authorities to issue public health orders uh, as well. And so the orders that uh, the director Gordon issued on October 9th restated most of the things that were included in the governor's pre-existing uh, executive orders, including the requirement for masks to be worn over the nose uh, and over the mouth in gatherings of two or more people, including stores, businesses, uh, and events. And businesses cannot admit people without masks with very few exceptions. Those epidemic orders that were issued on the 9th also included limitations on capacity, gathering size, uh, restaurants and bars that serve alcohol, uh, have to limit uh, their, their uh, attendance to, uh, to people who are seated at tables spaced six feet apart. You can't have dance floors. You can't have uh, open gathering areas in a, in a bar. Uh, and there were also requirements for, for isolation, for quarantine, for contact tracing. And Brian's going to get to that here in a few moments. If we can move forward. Uh, actually, one last thing I want to say about this. Uh, there's a lot of detail contained in those uh, orders that were issued on, on 9th. Very specific data about the numbers of people that can be allowed in certain places. I don't have time to get into all of those uh, data points now, uh, but I do encourage you, if you have any questions about that, to go to the state's website at michigan.gov slash coronavirus, and you can find all of that detail uh, very clearly there. Uh, the other thing that I want you to think about as you look at these orders uh, we know that these orders are also going to be challenged in the courts. And we don't know how the courts are going to rule on these orders. And so while I want you to be aware of, of what the orders require and to follow what the orders are, because they are the law at this time, I kind of want you to also set that aside a little bit and recognize that right now, the scientific literature that is growing every day is supporting these precautions as being very protective and very effective at limiting the spread of COVID-19. So whether it's the law or whether it's an order from some government official, uh, trying to set that aside as much as possible and doing these things because it is the right thing to do. These are things that can help keep your business open, can protect your consumers, can protect uh, your community and protect the people that, uh, that are so important to all of us. Uh, very important. So now if we can move forward to the next slide, please. One of the questions that we're getting is what is a public space? Because many of these orders refer to public space. And how that's defined is defined in the laws that are being used right now, including uh, the state's public health code. And so this is a question that we've asked our own corporate counsel. It's a question we've also uh, brought in uh, legal opinions from, from law firms here in town to help us understand this. And they have all told us that the law defines public space very broadly. And it really is any space where persons who are not from the same household can gather. So any place that's open to the public or where people are invited through employment, uh, any of these sorts of settings are defined as a public space in these laws. And so Places of employment certainly qualify as a public space. And with that, uh, I'm going to pause and I think that there are some questions that have come in. Uh, Steve, uh, do we want to take a few of those now? 
Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. London. This is uh, Lori Latham from Kent County. We do have a few questions that have come through also through um, our email. And a reminder to the participants as Dr. London, Dr. Bora, and Brian are answering questions, they are providing general public health guidance for very specific guidance for your organization. We encourage you to contact your human resources or legal counsel, but we will do the best that we can um, to answer those questions. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Steve Kelso, who's uh, got a few of the questions from our email participants. Good morning, everyone. I'm taking this directly from the participants' questions, and this one says this. Perhaps you'll answer this, but my biggest question is whether you, I think they mean the health department, are going to issue any shutdown mandates or recommendations for the county since the governor is unable to do so without legislative agreement. Yeah, so thanks, Steve, and thanks for that question. Uh, it's a good question. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, right now we have a number of, of epidemic orders that have been issued by the director of the State Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, he's using the same law that we have available to us at the local level to issue local restrictions. Uh, we have not done that uh, lately. We, we did issue some orders back uh, in March um, before uh, the, the, the governor had issued uh, executive orders. Uh, we don't have any orders locally that are standing now. We are looking at the data and if there are opportunities, if there are places where we believe that a difference can be made uh, by causing more good than harm by issuing uh, particular restrictions, we're going to consider that. Uh, we're talking to the state on an ongoing basis along with neighboring health departments to make sure that whatever we do is consistent with the science uh, and is going to contribute to the community being safer and not create more of a problem than, uh, than what we're trying to, uh, to resolve. So uh, it is something that we're going to consider on an ongoing basis. All right, very good. We have another one here. How long would an order be in place from the health department? Well, the, the orders that have been signed by, uh, by the director of, the, of health and human services uh, go month by month. And generally, when we do public health orders, they do go for a period of, of two to four weeks. We wanna make sure that any order that is, is executed is specific in solving a, a problem and has uh, a time frame to it that is reasonable for addressing that problem. And so that we're not just simply creating new laws that, that, have, no, uh, that have no termination date to them. So they would be short term. Uh, they are short term now from the state uh, as well. What do you suggest as decision points for the closure of public spaces? We'll be getting direction from Governor Whitmer and or the Kent County Health Department. Well, likely both. Uh, you know, right now what we're seeing is a statewide problem. In fact, we're seeing a, a national and an international problem. So what's happening here in West Michigan and in Kent County uh, is not uh, different than what's happening in, in most other places around the state. So, you know, I'm a supporter of let's try to have a consistent approach whenever possible. And so we do work closely with others to do that. We're looking very carefully right now at positivity rates. Uh, and Dr. Bora is gonna talk about that here in a few moments. Uh, and that's uh, some pretty fascinating information, so you wanna stay tuned for that. Um, and we're also looking at our hospital capacity, watching their inpatient numbers. Uh, we know that if our hospitals become overwhelmed, we're gonna start to see some unsuccessful outcomes with people who are getting care. And there is a pretty strong correlation to that mortality rate and the capacity of local hospitals. So uh, these are some, some things that you know, we're watching very carefully. If hospitals become overwhelmed, as that positivity rate increases, and as we see disparities in the community, we know that no one part of the community is going to be isolated from the rest of the community. We've seen that a number of times here where whenever we see this flare up in one part of the community, it does shortly thereafter spill into the rest of the community. So as we see these problems, we're going to move uh, to use the tools that we can to try to address them. Thank you, Dr. London. In the interest of time, we are going to maybe pause the questions for Dr. London and we will capture some of those at the end of the session. But we're now gonna to move to the Kent County Health Department Director, Dr. Narali Bora, who is going to give us an update um, kind of 
from a physician's perspective as well as testing. Dr. Bora? So good morning. Thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you, Lori. Um, so I just want to start off by talking a little bit about our hospitals. So we are seeing significant increases in all of our hospitals in their inpatient admissions for people with COVID-19 and in ICU admissions. What this kind of tells us is that we have been seeing an increased positivity rate in our community for the last several weeks. Typically hospitalizations and deaths from COVID tend to lag several weeks after someone's been diagnosed. So this is concerning. As we see our numbers increase now, we are concerned that hospital admissions are going to continue to rise. So increasing positivity. So a positivity means it looks at the number of people who have a positive test over all the people who have been tested. When we see increasing positivity, we know that we have more widespread transmission in our community. So it becomes more likely that the people that you interact with on a regular basis are either infected or have been exposed to the virus that causes COVID-19. So we can move on to the next slide. Um, so I can talk about these numbers later if there are more questions, um, but I really wanna talk about what can we do? We hear a lot of these numbers and it is worrisome, but there are things that we can do and we know how hard our community has been working to keep each other safe. And as our numbers rise, we just really need to maintain this vigilance so that we can get through this together. So I'm gonna go over some of the same points that you've heard for months, but I'm going to say them again because they really do make such a big difference. So number one is to wear a mask. You know, they protect you and they protect those people who are around you. It's really the simplest step that we can take every day. And we also need to make sure that we're enforcing mask wearing in our workplaces. Number two is keeping your distance. So keep your distance at lunch and on breaks um, and in social gatherings. We're seeing spread happen in small social gatherings. So when you socialize, wear a mask. Try to be outside and try to keep your distance from other people as much as you can. The next point is that if you feel sick, don't go to work and don't socialize with friends. We need to make sure that we have work environments in which people feel that they can be honest with how they're feeling um, and they can take time off when they're sick. The Kent County's Back to Work website has a free screening tool that um, employers can use to screen their employees and they also have access to PPE for places that do need um, additional help with masks and things like that. So on the slide, you can see it mentions behavioral health services. So this is hard. We've been in this pandemic for a long time. It's, you know, it's tiring for a lot of people. It's tiring for all of us. And we, you know, we have still a long ways to go. And so we know this is a taking a toll on the mental health of everyone of all ages. And so it's really, it's okay to reach out for help and it's okay for our employees and our family members to seek help if they need it. Our website does have a list of mental health resources that people can access to get additional help when they need it. And if there are concerns about workplace safety, there is a place on our website where people can, um, can mention those anonymously as well. So I wanna talk a little bit about, um, so sorry, I mentioned some of these things already. We can probably move on to the next slide. Um, but I wanna talk about a little bit more about who is more vulnerable for COVID and you know, who should be tested for COVID. So as we've seen, you know, not everybody who gets COVID ends up in the hospital. So among adults, we know that as people get older, as Dr. Linden mentioned, they're more likely to become severely ill from the virus. So severe illness means that someone may require, you know, they may need to be in the hospital, they may need to go to intensive care or have a ventilator for breathing support, or they may die. As people get older, their risk increases. So for example, people in their 50s, they're at higher risk of, than people in their 40s. And as they get older, that risk increases. So people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, their risk goes significantly higher. Also, people, adults of any age who have some underlying health conditions are more likely to become severely ill from this virus. And so, so I'm just gonna mention some of these. Uh, the CDC website has a list of all the different health issues, but some of the issues that make people more vulnerable are things like cancer, chronic kidney disease, um, COPD um, for people who um, are smokers, people who have heart conditions like congestive heart failure, um, people who are immunocompromised or are taking certain medications that affect their immune system, um, people who are overweight or obese, they can be at higher risk as well, people who have sickle cell disease or type 2 diabetes. So this is a list of a few conditions. Um, people with those conditions just need to have extra vigilance as they go to work and go through their daily routines. So who can get tested? So this site, this um, slide mentioned some of the conditions that people should have to get tested. But honestly, it's if you have symptoms of COVID, if you're just not sure, 
there's always a, that's never a reason not to get tested. Um, feel free to go get testing done. If you think you have been exposed to someone who has COVID, if you know that you've been exposed, these are all reasons to, to go and get testing done. In certain situations, uh, we, we, the health department or your physician may recommend testing. So for example, people who live or work in areas where there could be a high risk, for example, people who work in a, in a nursing home, um, certain areas, they may need testing on a more regular basis. So your business may also have specific protocols in place based on your risk in order to get that they would recommend testing on a more regular basis for that. So, you know, we get a lot of questions about, I think I may have been exposed to COVID. Um, you know, what do I do? And so testing is not a bad idea. It can help. So if someone's been exposed to COVID, they're going to need to be in quarantine for 14 days. And Brian's going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, if you are going to get tested because of exposure, it's helpful to wait five to seven days after you've been exposed. And this is because it takes time for the virus to replicate. If you're tested the day after you've been exposed, you may have a small amount of the virus in your body, but it's not enough to be picked up on a test. If you wait five days after being exposed, about 50% of people who get tested five days after being exposed are going to test positive. So that also means that half the people who are getting tested will test negative, even though they have some amounts of the virus in their body. And so this is why it's really important to wait those full 14 days after being exposed um, and to quarantine for that time and not really expose other people. So if you want to get tested, like his final word is that go ahead and get tested, but wait five to seven days. Even if your test is negative at that time, it's still possible that you could test positive a little bit later. So we are very lucky in Kent County that we have many resources for testing. Um, there is a site on our website that lists all the testing sites for the Kent County Health Department, and there are also um, sites that are in the community through other places. If you want to get tested, I would start off by calling your physician. Um, and then this website here shows a list of community sites that you can get testing done in it as well. The health department sites are available on the site. They're available for, you can register ahead of time or you can also walk in and they're free of cost. The turnaround time for getting a test result really varies. There's so many factors that affect how long it takes. Sometimes labs are you know, just very busy as a lot of testing is happening. Um, and places that will send labs to other parts of the state for um, or other, other states in order for the results to come back. It depends on how busy things are in other parts of the country as well. So this will change week to week and day to day. At this point, it's about 48 to 72 hours for results to come back after someone has been tested. And so um, if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer those. Thank you, Dr. Bora. And to those that are uh, participating, Dr. Bora will not be able to give direct medical advice, but she can provide um, some general public health guidance. And we do have a few questions from the participants. So I'm going to turn it over to Steve now to answer, ask you those questions. Dr. Bora, as I'm following the questions uh, that are coming in here, we're getting a number of questions from employers and employees asking about symptoms. When should they stay home? When they, should they be tested? When is it okay to come back to work? And we're in the cold and flu season, so it's pretty easy to confuse those symptoms as well, isn't it? Well, that's, those are really good questions. And it is true, and it is confusing. And we are starting to see flu in the community as well. And it's possible to have both. Um, there, I just heard that there's someone right now who has tested positive for both flu and for COVID. So I'm gonna go through the symptom screener um, that we have. So. This is based on the CDC guidance for symptoms that are concerning for COVID. So if you have any one of these symptoms, please don't go to work and please get tested for COVID. So if you have an uncontrolled cough, if you have shortness of breath, if you have difficulty breathing, or if you have loss of taste or smell, if you have any of those, that's enough to go and get testing for COVID. If you have two of the following, and I know this is hard to remember, so I'm just gonna read through it once just so you've heard it. Um, it's also concerning for COVID and you should also get a test. If you have fevers, chills, shakes, body aches, a sore throat, a severe headache, nausea or vomiting, diarrhea, fatigue, or congestion or runny nose. So if you have two of those, so let's say I have a sore throat and a runny nose, that is actually enough um, to be concerned for COVID and that would be enough to go and get a test for COVID. 
If you just have one of those, let's say you have a sore throat, I'm like, oh, is this allergies? Is this not? If you are uncertain, I think it's always a good idea to get a test. If you want to stay home for a day and see how you feel, if you just have one of those symptoms, if you're getting better, I think that's fine to go back to work. But if you're not getting better, I would recommend getting testing. And anyone with a fever shouldn't go to work. You should be home for at least 24 hours after you um, have no longer have a fever. We also get a lot of questions about uh, testing. Um, are some tests more accurate than others? Does Kent County offer a rapid test? Can you explain some of that to us? Yeah, no, those are lots of good questions. And so, yes, there are different types of tests that have different levels of accuracy. So the PCR test is a test that looks for virus particles, and this is the most accurate test out there. This is a test that the Kent County Health Department is doing, and as well as most of our health systems. Um, this is what takes about 48 to 72 hours for the turnaround time to come back. Um, these are really good at detecting the virus. If you test positive, it's likely it's a positive test. It's very rare to have a false positive result from a PCR test. If you test negative, the false negative rate can vary from like two to 30%. So if you're sick and you have a negative test, it's still worth getting a repeat test or um, waiting a little bit longer and not seeing other people because there is a chance you can get a false negative. It really depends um, on if, you're, if you have symptoms and test negative, it's, it still could be concerning for COVID. The antigen test is another test. So this looks for a protein on the virus particle. Um, this test is a little bit less sensitive. And so again, if someone is sick and has symptoms, it's going to be a much more accurate test. If you don't have symptoms and are just getting tested and you have the antigen test, there's still a chance that um, it's not gonna pick it up quite as well. The antigen test is the one that is, is one of the ones that is a rapid test, a 15 minute rapid test. That is um, none of the health department sites. We are not using that in any of our testing sites. Um, these are primarily available in the ERs and inpatient settings in our healthcare systems. And finally, there's an antibody test. The antibody test looks to see if your body has developed an immune response to, have a, to having a prior infection to coronavirus. So it takes about one to three weeks after you've been infected to show up in your antibody test. Some people don't have antibodies even if they've been infected. So it's not a foolproof test. And there are different kinds of coronaviruses. Some of them cause COVID-19, some of them cause a common cold. And so there's a chance if the antibody test is positive that it's picking up a different kind of coronavirus. So it's an interesting test, but it does not help to say if you have coronavirus right now um, or if you're infectious to other people. We've talked a lot about screening employees uh, for, for symptoms. Should we be screening people who come into our businesses I think that depends on what level of contact people will be having with the people who come in. Um, if people are wearing masks, it provides good protection for those around that person. If people need to be within six feet for a prolonged period of time to someone who's coming into a business, then I think that it would be a reasonable thing to consider. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bora. And in the interest of time and looking at the questions, it, um, we're going to now move to um, Brian Hartle, who is going to talk a lot about uh, contact tracing and what happens when COVID um, hits your workplace. So we will turn that over now to Brian. Thanks, Lori. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. Um, we know with a rising number of cases um, that there's potential that one of your employees will um, test positive for COVID-19. So we just want you to understand uh, what to expect you know, when that happens. Um, next slide, please. So the state orders uh, do require um, employers to call their local health department when they're notified of a positive case in one of their employees. So this here in Kent County, uh, you can dial this number 3260606 uh, to report uh, a positive employee to the local health department. And with the rising number of cases, unfortunately, you know, our staff is pretty strapped and so you may not get a call back right away. And so I think the, the next slide is just gonna talk about kind of what things you should take, uh, keep in mind you know, after you have a, a positive test in one of your employees. Most importantly, you wanna have that employee not at work. Uh, so those that employee who tests positive should be home in isolation and not leave their house until they're cleared by the Kent County Health Department. We'll talk about that in the next slide. Uh, contact tracing is looking at those in the workplace who may have been in close contact with that person during their infectious period. So I want to talk about infectious period just a little bit. Uh, so we look at two things. If the person has symptoms, we look at the onset date of that person's symptoms. 
If they do not have symptoms, we look at the test date uh, for their positive test. And we'll actually look back 48 hours from either the onset of symptoms or the test date of their positive test, and that starts their infectious period. So say, for example, someone tests positive on a Wednesday or uh, becomes symptomatic on a Wednesday, and they worked Monday and Tuesday, and they leave work on Wednesday. So you're going to want to look into your workplace to see anyone who's potentially in close contact with that individual for that Monday and Tuesday, and, and if they were at work on Wednesday, because there is the potential for pre-symptomatic transmission of COVID-19. Now, what is a close contact? Uh, we define close contact as being within six foot of an individual who tests positive <clears throat> for 15 minutes or more, or having direct physical contact with that individual. Now, the 15 minutes doesn't have to be a continuous exposure. It could be cumulative over the course of a, of a day. And so if someone has close contact with someone for five minutes at a time, you know, three or, three or more times throughout that day, then they can be considered a close contact. Now, we're hoping that, you know, workplaces have um, precautions in place, like Narali mentioned, um, to limit close contact, you know, spread out, uh, wearing masks. And so we're hoping that when you do that contact tracing within the workplace, you're not going to identify you know, a lot of people who, who meet that criteria. But if you do, you know, identify those individuals who are in close contact during that infectious period, we want those people to be sent home for quarantine. Um, it's a 14-day quarantine from the time of exposure, to the last date of exposure. And so those individuals uh, who are in close contact need to be uh, quarantined for, for that length of time. Probably already touched upon uh, the, the testing, so we're not going to do much with that. We get a lot of questions about cleaning the facility. Um, you don't have to shut down for long periods of time. Really, we're just looking at a, a shutdown period of time where you're able to do a deep clean of your facility. So that could be just overnight. If you have you know, someone test positive, you find out, you shut down for the, the night or the day, um, <clears throat> bring in a cleaning crew and clean it, you can open the next day. So it doesn't have to be a long extended period of time uh, where you shut down to clean. And then finally, if you don't have a, a employee health screening um, process in place, a screener, a daily symptom checker, you really want to have that in place after a, 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 one of your employees uh, does test positive. So on the employee uh, side, you know, what, what, what should you do? Uh, we kind of talked about this a little bit, but if you do uh, test positive or if you uh, are identified as a close contact um, of a positive case of, of COVID-19, you want to call your supervisor or human resources department immediately uh, so they can get the process in place, uh, start doing everything that we just talked about in the previous slide. Isolation and quarantine, you're going to want to do that. We'll talk about that in the next um, slide. Uh, if you are a close contact, obviously you want to monitor yourself for symptoms just in case uh, those symptoms show up at any point uh, over the 14-day period and then you know, get tested if you do uh, develop symptoms or if you don't develop symptoms after five days, if you're asymptomatic, uh, go ahead and, and, and get a test. So there's a lot, sometimes often confusion about what quarantine is and what isolation is. And so Quarantine is for close contacts who are not sick, but they've been in contact with a positive case of COVID-19 that meets that close, close, close contact uh, definition. Typically with COVID-19, um, symptoms start about two to 14 days uh, after the exposure. And so that's why we have quarantine for that entire 14 day period. And we do recommend people uh, comply with that. And as, as we talked about earlier with testing, Testing does not clear someone from quarantine. So if you do test during that 14 day period, uh, it's important to find out if you're positive, but if you're negative, we still recommend that you complete that 14 day quarantine period. And then isolation is for those who have been diagnosed with, with COVID-19. Um, we have a 10 day uh, isolation period from the time of uh, symptom onset or the test date um, of a positive test if someone is asymptomatic. And the people who are symptomatic must meet criteria for being released from isolation. We'll talk about that, I think, in the next slide. So um, in Kent County, you'll, you'll, we have two kind of systems in place for, for monitoring close contacts and monitoring of, of those who are testing positive. We're actually using a system um, from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, uh, where they have a, a crew of volunteers who are, are calling close contacts and monitoring them throughout uh, the 14-day quarantine period. Um, and so you'll, you know, if you're identified as a close contact, you'll be receiving a phone call um, initially from these uh, individuals to check on you and see if you have any symptoms. And then those, you, you, you can sign up for a text messaging system on a daily basis to receive those text messages. Um, that system will give you a uh, workplace exemption letter um, at the onset. So you can request that and they will send you a, a 
email with that letter that you can share with your employer. However, um, with, with the system, Kent County Health Department will not be providing release from quarantine letters to people who are close contacts. If you do require one of those for, from your workplace to get back to work as a close contact, you'll need to ask the, the volunteer who's, who's following you from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services you know, for that letter and then they'll in turn get in touch with Kent County Health Department to provide you with that letter. In terms of isolation, um, here are the criteria for being released from isolation. Obviously, I mentioned the 10-day uh, time frame, so that uh, you have to have at least 10 days passed uh, from the onset of symptoms of the date of the positive test. You have to be fever-free uh, for at least 24 hours when we check on you on that 10th day, and then you have to have improvement in your other symptoms. Your symptoms don't have to completely resolve at that 10th day, um, but they have to have improved. And if we see things like diarrhea or people just really not feeling well at that 10th day, we will extend that isolation period until they do meet those criteria. And so for those in isolation, the Kent County Health Department will be following those individuals. And on that 10th day, uh, if they do meet those, those criteria, we will provide them uh, with a, a release from isolation letter that they can um, in turn provide to their employer. I think that's my last slide. So I, hopefully we can uh, have a lot of time here for, for questions. Great, thank you very much, Brian. And yes, we do have a lot of questions as it relates to what happens if an employee tests positive for COVID in the workplace. So we're gonna to try to get to as many of those questions as possible. Brian, I'm gonna ask you to walk us through a real life scenario. We have uh, Sally, she calls in the morning, she calls the boss and she says, I've been tested and I, I'm tested positive. What happens from that point? Wow, so that's a long process. So she'll, you know, at some point, Sally will be getting a phone call from McCann County Health Department um, to do an investigation into her, her illness. But from a workplace standpoint, um, basically you'll wanna you know, check in with Sally and ask her, Sally, when did your symptoms start? Uh, did you have symptoms? Uh, and or if you did not have symptoms, when did you get tested? Because as I mentioned, that's the trigger point for that infectious period. And so if, if you find out that Sally got tested on a Tuesday and she was at work on Monday, um, then that's the point at which you'd want to um, you know, look at that contact tracing within your workplace. And then, you know, if you do identify any, anyone with potential exposures in the workplace, um, the Kent County Health Department will actually reach out to you at some point uh, to uh, ask you to let them know who those individuals are, because we'll add those to our, our system uh, to track those individuals for that 14 day quarantine period. You'll also wanna, you know, obviously do the, the cleaning, uh, notify those employees that might have been in close contact, uh, implement a, a screening uh, measure if you don't have that already in place uh, to really start pick up you know, potential uh, cases over the course of that 14 days after that exposure. And can you help me understand something? Why does someone who is actually sick have to be isolated for 10 days and yet someone who shows no symptoms is quarantined for 14? Yes, we get that question a lot, and it is uh, hard to kind of understand. Uh, but we, what we do know about the virus that when it infects someone, um, it can be potentially transmitted to other people for, the, for that 10 day time frame uh, from the onset of symptoms or the testing date. Uh, most research has shown that after that 10 days, there's no viable virus uh, in a person's body that can't, and so it cannot be transmitted you know, to other people. Um, as we talked about uh, in the, one of our previous slides, uh, the incubation period for COVID-19, that means the, the time from the exposure to someone who's sick uh, to the time that you can develop symptoms is two to 14 days. And so because anyone who is exposed can potentially develop symptoms for that entire 14 day time frame, that is why the quarantine period is 14 days. So I get it, it's, it's, it's confusing, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, um, but because that incubation period is longer, uh, then that potentially infectious period, that's why a person in quarantine has to be in there for 14 days. All right, now help us with something else, and this is something we get a lot of questions about, and it seems a little counterintuitive. If I'm in quarantine for 14 days, why can't I just be tested and be cleared from that quarantine if you know I don't have the disease? I think as Dr. Bora mentioned about testing, um, the nature of an infectious disease is that it's, it's, it's changing. So you may have a, a level of a virus in your body that's undetectable um, and it's still you know uh, replicating and, and getting to the point where it can be detectable or can cause symptoms so 
So just because you test negative on one day doesn't mean that you won't test negative you know, a few days from there. There's potential to develop symptoms the entire time. Um, and so you know, one test is just a, a point in time picture of, of, of what your um, body's situation is in terms of the viral load. And so you know, we have to wait that 14 days because there's potential for you to develop, develop symptoms or uh, be able to be tested positive over that entire 14 day period. Great, thank you, Brian. And uh, Dr. London and uh, Dr. Bora, we're now going to move into a lot of the participant um, question and answers. So if you could turn on your cameras and we'll start getting to as many of the participant questions as possible. But we're gonna kind of combine a lot of the questions that we're getting, and I don't know if this is for probably all three of you. Can you maybe briefly talk a little bit about the work that the Kent County Health Department is doing with our schools and what criteria is going into when you give a recommendation to go virtual um, in an effort to uh, control the community spread? Yeah, so I'll start with that one and then maybe turn it over to Dr. Bora. You know, I've been very impressed by our, our superintendents who have worked with us since March to make sure there are plans in place to make that learning environment as safe as possible for the students, of course, but also for their faculty. And, and this is incredibly important to us because we believe that keeping our, our schools uh, open as much as possible and making sure there are uh, many types of learning environments available, including face-to-face, -face, is a top priority for us. We know how important education is and all the supportive services besides education that are available to our students at school. Uh, so we have been working very carefully with them. Uh, we've made recommendations uh, to them throughout this pandemic. Uh, there have been a, a number of times now where we've made recommendations to temporarily close a school uh, because they were seeing an increase in cases and because they had many close contacts, uh, too many to, uh, to, uh, to continue with the face-to-face -face environment. Uh, and recently we're providing them with more information, more guidance uh, and, and more matrices regarding uh, decision making. I'll let Dr. Bora mention uh, that a little bit and the conversations that we're having uh, with them to keep those schools safe. Sure, so we're looking at national guidance um, on kind of what positivity rate is out there and what recommendations are for schools. But what's interesting is that there are not that many, uh, there's not much data to go by at this point. Um, we're still so early in the pandemic and many schools around the country have not opened to the extent that we have. So we are looking to see how do we provide local guidance for schools on making these decisions. Each district has its own separate um, nuances. They have own separate risk factors or communities have different needs. And so we wanna really take all of that into account. Um, we really believe that we need to keep our children, especially K through five um, in school as much as possible. And we feel that is probably the safest place for them, for many of them to be. The transmission in children of those ages is tends to be lower than in older ages. Um, so we're also looking at getting more data on a district or regional level in terms of how many new cases we have over the past couple of weeks. And that can be another indicator that can help schools understand, okay, we understand what the county positivity is, but what is really the risk in my own area? Because parts of our county, you know, our county is very diverse and we want to make sure that people have the information that they need. So we are still in the early phases of this. We have a draft of some ideas that we are, have sent to school um, superintendents and to some local physicians. They're working on providing us with feedback on that. And we'll hope to have a little bit more information that we can share more broadly um, sometime mid next week. But really this is an individual, um, at this point, each school is really being treated on an individual basis. If there are, um, if they cannot staff because so many staff are out because of quarantine or isolation, then if they need to close for that reason, then that is one of the reasons. Or if a really high percentage of children are in quarantine because of certain exposures, those are other reasons that we will look at. But we try to keep it as small as possible. If we need to close a classroom, we'll try to do that rather than closing the whole school if we really don't have to do that. Yeah, and there's another observation I think is really important for everyone on this call to, to, to hear. And that is that our, our schools, like our, our other workplaces, have done a pretty good job of planning to make sure that we have PPE, we have plans, that we have spacing, that we have all these things in place to make that environment safer. And to date, we have not seen, we have seen some, but we haven't seen a tremendous number of outbreaks in the schools. When we do, we're, we're seeing that many of those cases, uh, their exposure to sick people was often happening outside of the learning environment. And the same is often true with workplaces. 
So what's concerning us is that we both maintain the, the, the integrity of our prevention at school and at workplaces, but that we're also encouraging people outside of the workplaces to avoid the gatherings, to avoid the parties, to try to, throughout their life, do what we can to keep the outbreaks, this illness, from pouring back into our, our schools and workplaces. I want to get to another question we've just had come in, and I think this is probably best for Brian Arnold. When an employee has tested positive for COVID, we see one guidance that says they cannot return for at least 10 days, and we see another that talks about being able to return to work after a negative test. Can you clarify which avenue we should follow? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, basically, there's, there's several criteria for release from isolation. We typically uh, rely on the the uh, time or uh, symptom-based strategy, uh, which just basically looks at that 10 days and making sure that they are, are improving on their symptoms at that 10th day. Now, the CDC does have a, a test-based strategy as well, um, but that's not just not requires just one test. It actually requires two tests that are taken, you know, 24 hours apart. So you have to have two negative tests to be cleared earlier from isolation from that 10 days. And typically, um, that's not going to save you a whole lot of, of time. Um, from your isol isolation period because of the turnaround time for tests um, once, once you, you do test positive. Uh, so really we just uh, rely on that test or that uh, symptom-based and time-based strategy of 10 days and then having those symptoms improve. And in most recent CDC revision, they really recommend that that should only be used in rare situations, that test-based strategy that Brian mentioned. So really, yeah, those 10 days is what we need. All right, we're getting a lot of questions. Uh, we're going to kind of lump some of them together here. Um, we've got, in a work situation, we've got 10, 12 people. Can they gather in a conference room? Should they all have masks on? Should they be six feet apart? How do we monitor all of that? And even though we're cleaning all the spaces and everything, isn't there still a risk there? Brian, you want to take that one? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I think that's, that's the highest risk. Uh, we have with this virus is is people getting in close contact with each other. Uh, we know that that you know the virus is, is transmitted through droplets that can travel uh, up to six feet and even sometimes long or uh, longer than six feet. So so really those close spaces like that are really the highest risk environment. We've heard a lot of um, uh, stories about that. You know people going to trainings together, people riding in cars together. Um, you know, really that close contact is the biggest risk for transmission. And so, so as much as you can, you should avoid those, those types of situations in your work environment. All right, we have uh, another business here that says, we've invested thousands of dollars in the installation of multiple plexiglass dividers throughout the office and our production areas. So if an employee has COVID symptoms, but the employees working next to them are separated by one of these dividers, that eliminate them necessarily as a close contact? Yeah, if you know if that's if that's a situation, uh, if you have a situation where you have those uh, engineering controls in place, uh, where um, there's plexiglass between two folks, really that's going to shut down the, the potential transmission between that. And so, if that's a situation, and you kind of talk through that with the local health department, uh, those individuals likely would not be identified as a close contact with that that person. Is there any guidance on lessening the quarantining of essential workers or is the health department's position that they are not any different from anyone else who is working? Well, the CDC does um, provide guidance for the uh, criti critical infrastructure or essential workforce uh, that does uh, allow for, for some folks to work, you know, while they're under quarantine, as long as they, they remain asymptomatic and they take precautions, uh, many of the precautions we've already talked about um, you know, during that time that they're in quarantine. So, so there is, you know, uh, guidance out there for that critical infra infrastructure uh, employees uh, to work during that quarantine period. And we also, of course, are receiving a lot of questions about masks. One in particular has, I've been following the case numbers and the increase closely coincides with mask mandates and strengthened mask mandates. This person says the science is not settled on the effectiveness of masks. Many studies support mask wearing are only for health professionals. Do you believe that the proper use of masks is contributing to cases? No. 
No, we, we, we believe uh, in accordance with the, uh, with the preponderance of literature that is growing right now that uh, the consistent facial covering uh, use uh, lessens the, the incidence of, of illness. And while we all acknowledge that, uh, that facial coverings are not a perfect protective device, they have limitations that we all know about, uh, they do uh, both uh, lessen the probability of a person spreading the virus uh, to others. Uh, we now know through uh, literature that they also provide some protective quality for the person who's wearing the mask. And now there's a growing body of literature that, that says that uh, wearing a mask can actually lessen the severity of the symptoms that people uh, suffer on average. So uh, taken together, while we wish that we had years to study this uh, and to have uh, conclusive evidence and to have uh, unanimous thought around masks. Uh, we have uh, what we have, and that's the best that we have. Uh, and while not a perfect device, uh, like any other uh, protective uh, device, a seatbelt is not a 100% protective device, uh, but it is effective for risk reduction. Uh, and that's why we've made that recommendation. All right, we're coming up on a period of time, uh, the holidays are drawing near. And that of course means breaking bread with friends and family, and what type of guidance are we going to be able to provide people who want to get together with family and celebrate the holidays? Yeah, and I think we probably all have thoughts on this, and this is gonna be a challenge. Uh, and, and we all recognize that, that uh, as the holidays approach and we have cold weather, and so gathering outside becomes less of an option, uh, we, in accordance with the CDC, recommend that we keep these gatherings as small as possible, uh, we try to shorten them uh, a bit. Uh, we limit the number of people from different households that are coming together. Uh, we continue to, uh, to follow the advice around uh, facial coverings, hand washing, hygiene, uh, and all that. We understand it, it's gonna be really difficult. It's gonna be inconvenient. Um, we're sorry, it's a pandemic. There's not much we can do about it other than give you the information to reduce your risk. But keeping those gatherings as small and as brief as possible it is going to help us get through the holidays. I think also just really keeping in mind those people who are vulnerable to be really severely ill from COVID, those are the ones we need to really be thinking about. Perhaps they should not attend or if they're attending, they keep a mask on the whole time. And maybe people who are out in the community a little bit more really thinking twice if they should be visiting um, grandparents or those who are elderly right now. All right, we're coming up on uh, the 11 o'clock hour pretty quickly here. So very quickly, in 30 seconds or less, I'm going to ask each of you to tell me what is the number one thing you wish that people would come away with from this webinar? The most important things should know, people should know, and we'll start with Adam London. Uh, I, I would like for you all to know that uh, this is not going away uh, anytime in the near future, and we're all in this together, and I, and I don't say that lightly because um, I know that phrase has been thrown around a lot lately, uh, but if we're going to get through this, these next few months and get to a point where we have vaccine available, we all need to do what we can to limit transmission in the community. And the workplace is such an important part in that, uh, in that solution. In alphabetical order by first name, Brian Harold. I guess i uh, just like to, you know, let people understand that, you know, we are, are very busy right now. And so if you call us, and uh, we don't respond, respond right away. Um, just understand that we're busy, we're doing our best. Um, also, in some cases might not get followed up on right away, um, but the numbers that we're seeing, is, is tough for us to keep up. So, so we're gonna do our best uh, to keep up and do, do our duty, but to understand uh, that that may not be as timely as we'd hope it would be. Dr. Nirali Bora. Wear a mask, you know, protect yourself, protect others, protect your family, protect your friends. We all really are in this together. We need to be helping each other out if we're all going to get through this together. And um, we've seen that happen already, and we know it's going to continue. And um, we're here to help in any way that we can. Thank you. And then the last minute that we have available, we did receive a lot of good questions, and we weren't obviously able to get to all of them. We will work with our team and try to get the, as many of those questions answered and posted onto our website. So please check back to accesskent.com slash COVID or our social media sites as to when a recording of this will be available as well as answers to many of those questions. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. London for the last kind of final comments. 
Yeah, thank you, Lori. And thank you to everyone who put this webinar together. Uh, but most of all, thank you uh, to all of the business leaders and the employees who are doing this important work uh, here in Kent County. Uh, we just can't tell you how much we appreciate uh, your partnership and all that you're doing to make this community a healthier place for all. So thank you all very much. Uh, and we look forward to working forward uh, to working to you uh, throughout this fall and getting us to that point where we can all go on the offensive with vaccine uh, and get us to a resolution to this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This now concludes the webinar.